My name is Simon Parker, and as a travel writer and journalist, I've reported from some of the most extreme corners of the planet. I've sailed across ferocious oceans and trekked through some of the highest mountain ranges in an effort to document the power of Mother Nature. Been absolutely destroyed by a landslide. But now I'm embarking on my next epic journey at the gentle pace of a bicycle. From high above the Arctic Circle at the summit of Norway to the foot of the Scandinavian Peninsula in Sweden. Wow. Over the course of my 2,000 mile adventure, I'll be learning about the natural cycles of the region as a green and fertile summer slides into the frozen grips of winter. I'll be searching for seasonal foods and elusive wild animals with the people that call this place their home. I'm passing through at a time of harvest and splendor and I'm seeing it all on two wheels. This is Earth Cycle. Norway's North Cape, the northernmost point of Europe and the very top of the Scandinavian peninsula. The North Pole lies just 1,500 miles or so beyond these craggy, windswept peaks, but thankfully I'm setting my sights south to ever so slightly warmer climbs. This is a realm of windswept tundra, freezing storms and isolated fishing communities, and I'm on a mission to explore it from the perspective of a humble bicycle, a slow but eco-friendly mode of transport I've used to travel many tens of thousands of miles all over the world. For hundreds of years, the North Cape has been a place of pilgrimage. Kings and queens and religious figures used to come up here because this place was really seen as the end of the earth. And now I'm here, I can testify that it really does feel like that. It may be difficult to believe, but this is late summer in the Arctic. And despite my first soggy impressions, this is the most fertile time of the entire year. The sun, when you can see it, still hangs high in the sky, and the resilient animals that call this place their home are now frantically preparing for the long, cold and dark winter that awaits them. They're clearly much better prepared for the elements than I am. There's about half a dozen reindeer over here. My first few hours in the saddle have really started to hammer home the sort of challenge that lies ahead of me. It's hard to comprehend, but this is still part of Europe, and I'm just a few hours north of densely populated cities like London, Paris and Berlin. On the first part of my journey, I'll be cycling through Norway's least inhabited county, Finnmark. I'll zigzag through epic fjords and sprawling valleys, and jump between a series of cut-off islands via boats and bridges. Finally, I'll weave my way up and over the lofty Lingen Alps, before descending south into Swedish Lapland. At the very top of Europe, life on land remains inextricably linked with the seasonal toing and froing of the Arctic Ocean. And despite feeling undeniably anxious, I volunteered to help local fisherman Jonathan pull in a particularly ravenous invasive species. Is it too late to mention that I probably have some of the weakest sea legs in the history of sailing? Emily, named after my little daughter. New boat from uh, last year, this time last year, it's a year with me. What are you expecting it to be like out there? Because I'm not the, uh, the steadiest on my feet out at sea. We, you can just say you're in the Arctic Circle, it's hard weather, but today this is a fantastic, beautiful day. Winds low, little bit of rain in the air. This is as good as it gets, but tonight, full storm coming in, and that's what we're used to. So if there was a day to go fishing in the Arctic, this is the day to do it? For someone like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate that. Please look after me. That's ready us to go. Originally from Surrey in the south of England, Jonathan arrived in the Arctic in 2010 not only with the intention of simply escaping the rat race, but to also try his hand at the potentially lucrative profession of Arctic fishing. Almost every day, come rain or very occasionally shine, Jonathan leaves the calm safety of Honingsfork Harbour and makes a beeline for the treacherous Arctic Ocean. It's right now, though, at the end of summer, when the weather is often at its best, providing Jonathan with a short but predictable seasonal weather window like a farmer needing to make hay while the sun shines. It would be easy to kind of assume that this sort of place is just wet 
and windy and a little bit grim most of the time. But over the course of 365 days, do things change? Yeah, of course. I mean, we notice the changes incredibly because it's so intensive. So the, the flower time, uh, the autumns and the springs are so intensive. How is this in contrast to what it would be, say, in January or February? January and February is the testing weather. It's the winter. First it's dark all the way to the 15th of January, approximately. So we're working in the dark with all lights on the boats and so forth. It's challenging. I mean, you have wind temperatures of bringing the temperature up to minus 30 degrees, working in that with waves of a few meters at least. This is really a holiday for us to work now. So what is it that I've come all this way to see? Well, the answer lays 200 meters below us scurrying in the murky depths between Russia in the east and the Norwegian Sea to the west. Whoa! Not, not the best catch, but not the worst catch. Here they are have, uh... huge! Wow! That one must be three or four kilos. Yeah, he's a good one. They're the largest species of crustacean on the planet, and with a whopping two-metre-wide leg span and some weighing as much as 12 kilos, it's no wonder they're known as the kings of the ocean floor. An army of invasive king crabs has been eating everything in its path, totally destroying the seabed. They don't have any natural predators and nothing can stop them from marching into new territories in their millions. That's the lucrative bounty. Look at the size of that thing. Oh my goodness. By the time Jonathan sends his catch to the swanky seafood restaurants of South Korea on the other side of the planet, these crabs can fetch up to 250 US dollars a kilo, meaning what's good for the local environment is also good for Jonathan's pocket. <laughs> Would you give me a job? Uh, we can train you up. We can train you up. OK. <laughs> With the final net dragged onto the boat and my queasy stomach starting to slosh from side to side, thankfully it's time to return to the serene stillness of the harbour with a hefty haul of more than 200 crabs. How did they get here? Yeah, they, they were launched here in the 60s from Russia, so they were brought here as an experiment. And now, uh, yeah, we have to try as fishermen to stop them going further south. So we have an open quota, which means that we can fish as much as we want, whatever size we want, to try and stop them from going south, so we can help the environment, if you like. How can you eat more fresh than this? You see, the idea is you pull it off as one piece of meat. Sweet, succulent and high in protein, plus now slightly fewer left to destroy the surrounding seabed, doing our bit to save the planet has never tasted so good. And for the first time in my adventure, I feel warm, dry and full of nutritious food, sufficiently refueled for the gruelling challenges that lay ahead. Thank you very much <laughs> for having me. I really appreciate it. Amazing experience. I've got this new fangled respect for people like Jonathan who go out to see every single day to pull up this sort of catch. It just goes to show that even up here, the seasons of the planet are still happening. And even this incredibly invasive species can, in a very tiny way, be maintained by fishermen like Jonathan. That was a real privilege and a very unique experience. Up here in Finnmark, there's only about 75,000 people that live here. Now, to put that into some sort of context, this county is as big area-wise as countries like Scotland and Denmark. But in those countries, there's almost five or six million people living there. And when I'm cycling through here, I get a genuine feeling of how remote and isolated this corner of the planet really is. After a particularly damp and miserable start to my adventure, I'm cold and with night falling rapidly, I'm growing increasingly desperate for a place to put up my tent. I think I'm going to camp somewhere around here. There's this wonderful thing in Scandinavia where as long as you're respectful you can pretty much get away with 
camping anywhere, as long as you clean up after yourself, they call it all man's right to put up your tent anywhere. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. It's pretty epic. Pretty epic. Now, how's that for a room with a view? Well, rather embarrassing. Um, this is actually someone's garden, essentially. Uh, they live up on the hill up there. And uh, they came down here, and I was putting up my tent, and I thought, oh, no, they're going to tell me to get lost. But actually, they've been incredibly inviting and said, um, yeah, no worries. Put your tent up, make yourself at home. And this is what I've read about, the great Scandinavian hospitality. Thank you for letting me yeah. um, hang out in your shed. That's really kind of you. And you've got mosquito repellent. Yeah, yeah. Mosquito, <laughs> ready for it to use. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was lovely to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> lovely to meet you. <laughs> OK, so it's not oak cuisine and a cosy hotel suite, but compared to a night in a damp one-man tent, this is a luxury I'd be a fool to turn down. The next stage of my journey south will see me move increasingly closer to the Arctic Circle. It's here where I'll meet some resourceful locals that are creating alcohol from a seasonal ingredient growing all around them. I'll then pedal on to the border with Sweden, that is, if I can still stand. Since leaving the North Cape, I've battled against inclement rainstorms and braved gale force winds. It's been physically demanding, but in the process I've also met some generous and adventurous locals and sampled some of their delicious local delicacies. Rested and dried out, I'm up at the crack of dawn, ready as I'll ever be for another long day on the bike. Now, though, I'm cycling through the Lingen Alps, just 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Temperatures here can drop to minus 40 degrees centigrade in winter, but right now, at the end of summer, I'm pushing on south in a balmy plus seven. The scenery is undeniably breathtaking, and I'm really trying my best to take it all in and appreciate the views. But just getting over these gruelingly steep mountain passes is proving a hard enough challenge in itself. Yes, nice to meet you too. <laughs> How far are you going? North Cape. North Cape, from where? Germany. From Germany, cool. That climb has really just found me out. I didn't know what to expect. I asked that German guy if there was much climbing to come and he said, no, not really. So, it definitely lured me into a false sense of security because that was tough. That's as tough as anywhere I've cycled. Gouged out by hundreds of gigantic glaciers during the last ice age, northern Norway's fjords serve as tranquil refuges for the local Arctic marine life, safely sheltered from the swirling open ocean. In fact, if you excluded Norway's 1,200 fjords, then the country would actually only have a coastline of just 1,600 miles. Include them, though, and that distance jumps to a whopping 18,000. That's just over 100 miles now, and that's the end of an extremely long day. I'm hoping the longest day cycling I'm going to have to do on this entire trip. At 51 miles long, Lingenfjord is one of the largest in Norway. And although it feels a little bit like I'm cheating, I'm taking a tiny shortcut from one side to the other. Sometimes on these journeys, it's sensible to just stand still for a moment and simply admire the epic views around me. Because tomorrow, I'll be finding out how these vast Arctic fjords and a very special summer crop found within them are not only inspiring professional craftsmen, but also passionate amateurs with an ambitious vision for the future.
Perched on the rocky banks of Lingen Fjord, the Aurora Distillery, headed by Yarman and Thor, prides itself on using local and seasonal produce. How important is it to you and how important is it to the people that live in this part of the world to be using seasonal ingredients and to be harvesting things at a time of the year when they're ready to use? It's been important as long as there have been people up here in, in the Arctic. Our culture is based on seasonal harvesting, both, both seasonal harvesting of the sea and also seasonal harvesting of all the berries and, and all what else that the nature gives us. In the autumn, it's, it's, um, Jermen's main job is to go out there and get some berries. So if it's not in the, in the still room here, I'm hoping that he's up in, around here picking berries. They distribute their spirits all over Europe and usually rely upon foraged berries and grains to flavour their drinks. However, right now, during the brief transition between summer and autumn, the waters surrounding them are packed full of a tender and apparently delicious seaweed that's just ripe for picking. I'm not sure if I'm really a help or a hindrance, but I've been roped in to lend them a hand and I'm trying my best to keep us both dry. And this is the all-important crop which they're using to distill with here, high in the Arctic. Once the seaweed's been harvested, it goes through a process of being washed, chopped and then meticulously weighed, before then encouraged to mix with Yaman's heady raw spirit as it's heated to almost boiling point. What goes in as a crude mixture of slimy seaweed and about 90% unrefined booze starts to drip out as a liquor infused with the subtle taste of the Arctic. So this is our seaweed alcohol, the first taste, okay. Yeah, definitely. Mm. It has a very distinct taste of the sea. Yeah. And that must be a nice feeling for you <laughs> as the guy who's made this, <laughs> that it does actually taste the way you intended. The problem is that in its current state, it's still far too alcoholic for even the hardiest drinkers to try and guzzle down. I confess to liking a drink or two at the end of a hard day's ride, but this stuff is rocket fuel. So you are finding out how strong this alcohol is literally by putting in floats? Yeah, and together with the temperature. This is a precise and exact science. By weighing the water and testing the temperature, he's managed to work out that this is actually 68.8% alcohol. So what he's now doing is he's going through a process of finding out exactly how he's going to be able to balance that out to make it a legal product. So this is the finished article. Part of this was floating around in the fjords outside, up here, high in the Arctic Circle. After all his hard work, I don't think Yarman's going to let me get away without at least giving the finished product a taste, even if I do have to get back on the bike for the afternoon. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Cheers. My on the nose and in the mouth, you can really pick up Mm. the essence of the sea. You can really pick up the tastes and the smells of the ocean. For me, the whole essence of this journey is to learn about the seasonal cycles of this incredible and extreme landscape. These guys are harvesting something which is so incredibly plentiful and they're bottling it up to be used and consumed either right now or who knows, maybe five, 10, 15 years in the future. And there's something very special about that. As I cycle south, I'm noticing the roads growing ever so slightly busier. And while there might not be many of them in contrast to the rest of Europe, the locals who do call this place their home are a resourceful bunch especially it would seem when that results in a decent drink. On first impressions, the rugged harshness of this Arctic landscape doesn't immediately jump out as a place of fertility or harvest. But when you look a little closer, when you move slowly at the speed of a bicycle, there is certainly a transformation taking place. 
is just more subtle than what most of us are used to in the warmer regions of the planet. Trun and Kura are artists from the city of Tromso, and they've set out on a journey to create the world's first beer made entirely from a rare Arctic algae. They're not professional or strictly scientific like the distillery, but their project is certainly packed with passion. Inspired by an ancient tale from the northwest corner of Arctic Russia, where the local Inuit are believed to have brewed an alcoholic drink vaguely resembling beer, Trun and Kura are slowly refining their own process. So tell me exactly, what are you doing with this? You're coming out here, you're harvesting this, but what are you actually doing it? What's your purpose with this stuff? The, the goal is to make drink that is 100% based upon seaweed. And so far we come to a drink that is 50% based upon seaweed, and it's quite challenging to reach that goal. What's so special about this seaweed in comparison to other types of seaweed in relation to what you guys are trying to do? Yeah, well, this is completely digestible by man in raw form. And it has, um, it has a very high protein content. It is good, I like it. When we take this now, we will go back and we will hang it up to dry. And that means that the salt which is in this, which is not good for brewing, it will crystallize out and you get like a white surface. And that means that it's much easier to rinse off the salt. They then boil it up with yeast and water before bottling the resulting liquid into pretty much anything they can get their hands on. So this is your pub. <laughs> I love it, it's really cool, man. Huh? Really. So it certainly doesn't look like any beer I've encountered before, and their pub, like them, is eccentric to say the least. But I've got to hand it to them. Their passion for creating something from scratch, with an ingredient growing abundantly around them, is exactly the sort of project that gets me excited. OK, so I'm going to have a taste. Talk me through what I should be experiencing. No, actually, we don't want to say anything. We don't want to say anything. OK, it's all yeah, left up so to me. OK, here really we go. Here we go. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Skull. 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 Thank you. I have absolutely no idea what to expect. It's undeniably weird and wacky, and it tastes nothing like any beer I've ever had before. But their brew is local, seasonal and sustainable, and I'm pretty sure it's going straight to my head. Cheers. Skull. Cheers. Thank, you. Thank you. These artists living up here right in the Arctic Circle. They are taking something right on their doorstep and they are making it into something which is not only aesthetically pleasing, but something that also tastes good. I guess on face value, this is a little bit wacky, a little bit left field. But I am really also overwhelmed with their excitement. This is a really, really cool project. I've now cycled more than 500 miles since leaving the northernmost point of Europe, and I'm approaching the border with Sweden, just north of the Arctic Circle. This is an imaginary line that divides the polar region of our planet from the warmer and more fertile climates of the south. Above it, only the hardiest flora and fauna can survive without the warmth of the sun, but below it, northern Europe basks in its life-giving glow, some of which I feel I'm in desperate need of myself. The first part of my adventure has certainly been tough at times, however the gentle speed of travelling by bicycle has given me time to reflect on the subtle shift of the natural world around me as it edges from summer into winter. Well I have been to some dodgy and quite frankly dangerous border crossings all over the world in the past 10 or 15 years, but none of them have been remotely this sleepy. There's quite an eerie, weird feeling to this place. This does mark a crossroads in my journey. I'm saying goodbye to Norway to the north, and I'm entering Sweden to the south. Next time, my adventure enters Sweden, where I'm sampling the sweet tastes of late summer and lying in wait for some of the country's rarely seen large mammals before heading off in search of one of Earth's most spectacular natural wonders, the Northern Lights. Ah.